gucken. Ah. One second. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining one hour edition of uh, the Cloud Native Computing Links. Um, so as always, before starting the, the meetup, let me go over a couple of things that we'd like to, to share with you, and then we can pass to the, to the speakers. So, well, if you have a Twitter and you use it, uh, well, I always say that because I have a Twitter and I don't use that much, <laughs> but you can follow us over there. And if you are sharing something regarding the, uh, related to the, to the talks today, just tag us and help uh, grow in the community. It's our handle is cloud native links. And if you want to follow the, the community, well, most probably you are already a member from meetup, but we are also part of the community of CNCF. And you can find us on uh, community.cncf.io slash links. Uh, so the agenda for today, uh, we are starting with me, uh, with this welcome message. Then the first talk will be Matt Jarvis from uh, SNCC. Um, well, uh, and then in the middle, we do a, a, a networking action or event with some icebreaker questions, something that we are doing for the last two editions and it's been fun. Then at about 6.10, we go to Raina uh, with the second talk and close to seven, we are just doing some closing remarks. Nothing much special. Um, well, um, from my end, of course, the talks are, are super nice. <laughs> And already, uh, I would like to thank Matt and Reina for, for accepting the invite and uh, sharing the, the talks with us. So we follow the, the Berlin Code of Conduct. So uh, that if you would like to know more about the Code of Conduct, you can access berlincodeofconduct.org. But basically, uh, be nice with everyone. Uh, we are an open community. Uh, everyone is welcome. Doesn't matter your gender, where you're from, uh, your level, uh, yeah, anything. So please, uh, everyone is welcome and be kind with everyone. Um, cool. So the organizers, I'm Giuliano. I'm a soft engineer um, at Dynatrace. Here is my Twitter handle. I, as I mentioned, I don't use Twitter that much, but you can follow me there. Uh, and I usually post things related to the, the cloud native, uh, related to the meetup. Um, the co-organizer of the meetup is Jürgen. Jürgen, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Jürgen. Uh, I'm the co-organizer of this meetup. Um, I tweet uh, maybe a little bit more than Giuliano and mostly around the open source project I'm a maintainer of and have involved in, uh, it's called Captain. Uh, so if you're interested in any uh, CI, CD and uh, uh, cloud native uh, delivery, uh, and then uh, maybe it's a, it's a good idea to follow me. Uh, I, I'm yeah, regularly um, tweeting about these topics. Uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to hear this week's or this, this month's talks. Uh, I think this, this time is all around security. So by chance, we have two speakers uh, that uh, target this topic, which I'm really excited. And uh, just as a side note, I was uh, lucky enough last year, I think, um, to join one of Matt's meetups. So he's also a meetup organizer. Was it Edinburgh or Manchester? I, I'm not... uh, that's a good question. They all merge into one now. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it might have been Edinburgh, actually, wasn't it? <laughs> it was all virtual. And I know yeah. it was far, far away from, from here. It was on another island, but it was virtual. <laughs> So <laughs> you'll have to join us in person once this is all over. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'd love to. Uh, yeah, I'm heading back to, to, to Juliana. Thanks. Cool. Thanks. Uh, yeah, well, so if you would like, if you are watching this and you think you can contribute with the community, please reach out to us. Uh, you can ping us on uh, Twitter or LinkedIn, or you can submit a talk 
under uh, tinyurl.com slash CNC links talk. Or if you're a company and you would like to sponsor the meetup, uh, we have uh, some packages that you can contribute with us. Um, just the same, reach out to us, or we have a form where you can put the, the data that you want and uh, the, the, your proposal under tinyurl.com slash CNC links sponsor. Um, we try to keep the, the, the discussion ongoing. Uh, it's hard sometimes, and depending on, on the topic, um, there is no much people active in Discord afterwards, but the idea is to have a place where everyone can discuss and we can promote the next events as well. So a kind of community outside the meetup or the CNCF page. So join us on Discord at tinyurl slash cnc links slash dis uh, discord and you will join the, the server where we we are uh, yeah so as i mentioned today's speakers we have matt jarvis and uh reina stropek uh sorry if i didn't pronounce your uh names properly uh i think mainly reina it's harder for me <laughs> Uh, as a Brazilian, I'm still getting the, the German pronunciation properly. <laughs> uh, and yeah, with that, I think I have everything from my end. And this stage is all yours, Matt. Thanks again. Thank you, Giuliano. Okay, let's, uh, let's get the show on the road. Uh, where are we? So hopefully you should all be seeing my screen now. Is that all? Uh, is that all working, folks? Excellent, yep. excellent. Okay. Uh, so um, this is me. Um, my name's Matt Jarvis. I'm a senior developer advocate uh, at a company called Sneak. Um, Sneak are a cloud native application security company. Um, I've been around uh, open source for a, for a, a very long time, probably more than twenty years. Um, and I've, I've kind of worked in, in operations, in product development, in DevOps, and now in security. Um, there's a bunch of different ways you can, you can get in touch with me. Feel free to reach out if you want to ask any questions or, or learn uh, anything more. So um, the story of the last uh, kind of decade or more in software development has really seen the boundaries of what's an application uh, what is operations and what constitutes infrastructure um, becoming increasingly uh, blurred. The old view of the world was that the application was the only piece under the responsibility of the development team. And all those other elements of the stack sat under IT operations. And security was usually a step right at the end of, that, uh, of the deployment process. And the world we live in today is one where our infrastructure and our workloads are almost completely tied together. Um, everything's declared as code, everything's a software development practice, and there's really no difference between our um, workloads and the computing infrastructure that goes along with it. And by infrastructure, we don't just mean the underlying compute technology, but also um, the, the configuration, the operational policies that control uh, those capabilities. And as a, a, a community of practitioners, um, we've discussed uh, in immense detail the blurring and consuming of the boundaries between development and operations. But in lots of cases, we really haven't considered how that impacts on how we, um, how we model, how we practice security. In lots of organizations, security is still considered to be this uh, external practice that somehow only exists when our applications are deployed and operational. Um, but this is kind of unworkable in the era of continuous integration, continuous delivery. Um, development driven uh, teams now have responsibilities for most of our deployment stack. Um, so as we said, they, not just the, the workload itself, but, but the infrastructure in terms of container images and Kubernetes configuration and all that kind of stuff. And so this gives those teams a, a much greater responsibility for ensuring that um, those things are secure. And by the time our 
code and our infrastructure is deployed to production, it's really far too late to deal with the implications of security issues. Um, we can't slow down that velocity to introduce uh, security gates in, in the ways that things used to work because um, development velocity and therefore time to market for our applications is clearly the, the differentiator for, for um, businesses to be successful. So that presents us with a set of, of pretty unique challenges around security. How do we make sure that our applications and our infrastructure are secure when our working practices are evolving into these super fast delivery pipelines? Um, security still matters. And as we've seen repeatedly over the last few years, um, security breaches can have a, a really big impact on, on businesses, both in a, from a financial perspective in terms of um, reduced revenue, potential fines, um, but also on how trusted our customers see us as. And trust is really one of the key metrics for um, successful uh, organizations in the era of, of cloud. So let's start by taking a look at the different classes of things that we probably need to be looking at uh, to ensure that we've got security considered within our workflows. So firstly, the applications that we're creating um, are workloads. And uh, modern applications are usually composed of a, um, a relatively small core of homegrown code, along with a huge amount of um, third party, usually open source um, modules. And this is great news for application development because the availability of modules and packages means we get to develop applications faster, we can write less code, uh, we don't reinvent the wheel all the time by solving the same problems over and over again. And anyone who develops in Java, in Python, in Node, in Go is going to recognize this pattern. And in all of those ecosystems, the number of vulnerabilities is growing. Um, this doesn't necessarily uh, mean that code is getting more insecure. It can just be because there are just there's just more code being written. Um, and it could be because we're also getting better at working out what's vulnerable. But in the end, what this means is that there's more opportunities for those vulnerabilities to be exploited. And each of the modules, the packages that we bring in to our code base can have a very large dependency tree. Um, both in terms of direct dependency, so the things that we're going to declare in our in our um, uh, in our configuration for for our application, but also indirect dependencies, and these are the ones that we need to worry about. Really, they're the dependencies of dependencies. So we can potentially bring in um, a ton of other modules that we might not even be aware of, and. Um, you know, very quickly we can be we can be uh, declaring a single dependency, and now we've got 120 packages being pulled in. Um, and uh, so those indirect dependencies are ones that we have less control of, and we're, we we might not be aware of them at all. And to look at an example of what that can turn into, here's an exploit from the Node community. This was introduced into NPM in 2018. Um, this get cookies uh, um, uh, uh, library is supposedly to pass HTTP headers, um, but it's actually a remote um, execution exploit. And you know it's about 40 lines of code, processes um, remote JavaScript, executes stuff on the server via the use of specially crafted commands in the HTTP request. And uh, this was hidden behind a tree of other dependencies. And then the direct dependency um, eventually ended up being used in, in this mail parser library, which has a huge amount of downloads a month. So it's pretty easy to see how in large developer communities, uh, these kind of indirect dependencies can be used to hide exploitable code. Uh, there's also uh, been um, uh, quite a lot of talk um, recently around the software supply chain problems where people are misnaming packages to catch uh, um, people putting typos into uh, to package declarations and so pulling in modules that uh, that uh, that may be exploitable just as a result of putting a typo in your package.json or, or whatever um, the particular mechanism that your your uh, your application code base is using. 
So those vulnerabilities in, in third party dependencies are, are super important because they make up such a large part of our code bases these days. Um, but as I said earlier, the lines between our application and the container it runs in are becoming increasingly blurred. And the container is the delivery mechanism for the application. It, the container, the application may never exist outside of that container. Um, they're typically developed at the same time, uh, or quite possibly by the same team. So for all intents and purposes, we can kind of consider them the same thing. You know, the, the, the whole thing becomes uh, our, our workload. And like the availability of, of library code, the huge growth in, in public container registries has been great for the ability to run uh, prepackaged software super easily and for us to easily consume that stuff in our own infrastructure. But they are also a, a source of vulnerabilities. And there's been some some fairly well known quotes over the last uh, the last um, uh, few months about uh, how we should consider some public uh, container registries to simply be a source of malware. Um, and when we look at the container landscape, um, although best practices are emerging around things like uh, building minimal containers, you know, maybe looking at things like distroless or scratch to, to reduce our attack surface. Um, there's still a huge amount of people using these containers directly from the upstream repositories. And uh, lots of these can have very significant amounts of vulnerabilities in them. And um, so we're presented with a lot of attack vectors through this mechanism of, 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 of stuff being able to get into our software supply chain. And it's really important that our developers understand the, the risks associated with this and, and how we can go about fixing it. And there's also kind of almost a, a long tail taking a path of least resistance by giving applications containers based on a full operating system. And when we look at operating systems in general, the amount of vulnerabilities in base operating systems is massively growing, um, partly because operating systems by design ship with a lot of software in them. Um, even if that's an operating system container, it's going to have a, a lot of stuff in it. Um, you know, personally, I think using these kind of operating system based uh, um, uh, containers can sort of break the paradigm of, of, of what we're trying to do in containers, but, you know, we still see a lot of people using these kinds of images. Um, and this is, was an interesting stat from, from the open source uh, uh, security report that, that uh, Sneak did in 2019. Um, we can see that people really don't think about emerging vulnerabilities once their workloads are in production. So an image that you used when you, when you deployed that workload might now have vulnerabilities in it, even if you scanned it and it didn't have any when you deployed it. Um, so if you're not looking at containers that you already have in production, then you're never going to find out if they are now um, vulnerable. And fixing a lot of this stuff usually isn't very hard. Um, over 40% of Docker image vulnerabilities can usually be fixed by um, upgrading the base image. And, and around 20% can be fixed just by rebuilding them because, you know, perhaps in the Docker file there's some, some uh, upgrade pathway in there that's going to make sure that, that certain things are more up to date. And as we've kind of moved wholesale into cloud and now into Kubernetes, um, configuration's almost entirely in code. And it's, again, it's part of our development workflows. And by configuration, we can include all of our Kubernetes YAML, um, Helm charts, automation, Terraform, and policies and configuration that goes alongside that. And um, this is a massively growing field, as we can see from the amounts of, of this kind of code that's in GitHub now. Um, we're really only just starting to view that as something that we need to even consider from a security perspective. Um, systems like Kubernetes are increasingly um, complex. And, um, and as we've moved the responsibilities for developing that kind of code into our development teams, there's clearly space for misunderstandings about how things work. Um, this is compounded with things like service meshes, which increase this complexity even more. Um, and with this much code out there in the public domain, you can again see the potential risks of the sort of path of least resistance where, oh, that looks like what I'm trying to do. I'll just take that code, modify it a bit. And I might not fully understand what's going on under the, under the hood. And these are all um, very, very important in the security of our environments. Um, this quote from OWASP is a, is a little bit old now, but it still proves the point that 
uh, a huge amount of security breaches are coming from misconfigurations in infrastructure um, as we've kind of moved faster and faster into into cloud and, and Kubernetes. And you know, in most cases, big the big breaches that have happened are a combination of, of app level vulnerability, then combined with infrastructure misconfiguration, which has allowed an attacker to uh, widen the blast exploit of the 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 uh, the, the blast um, uh, radius of of uh, the original exploit. Um, and as I'm sure most of us who are familiar with operating these kind of platforms are aware, there are lots and lots of real world examples of this. Uh, cloud credential leakages through GitHub is a really a classic one, or you know clusters infested with uh, with crypto miners. And you know these are all related to to uh, to this idea of uh, of misconfiguration. And um, you know when we look at this space in terms of Kubernetes, it's really important to realize that Kubernetes doesn't give you any guardrails. You know it's kind of insecure by default, um, and, and that's not that that that's a you know that's a design decision rather than a than a particular fault. Um, certainly, if you if you consume. Um, if, if you consume uh, uh, sort of productized versions of, of Kubernetes, you you do have some some differences here. You know, OpenShift by default comes with a lot of of, uh, of security defaults. But you know, if you're consuming upstream uh, and in general, most of the cloud platforms are providing fairly vanilla um, upstream in order to maintain compatibility. You know, you're going to have to make some of these decisions for yourselves. And you know, by default, things like there are no resource limits set. So that means a pod can potentially consume as much resource as the kubelet will let it. Um, and that has potential for, for denial of service, maybe just on that node, but possibly uh, affecting your entire application. Um, Kubernetes will also happily allow you to run containers as root. And you know when we look at, uh, uh, at containers in public registries, the vast majority of them are actually still configured to run as root. And that opens up major security implications. You know, if you compromise a pod that's running as root, you've got um, the potential to escape the container. And so, you know, we really need to be limiting the potential for these kind of attacks. Um, very, very few applications need root access to run in in the real world. Um, you know, once you actually start digging into what what applications need. Um, a, a lot of this is just uh, is just um, the path of least resistance. It's just easier to, to run as root than we'll work out what, what permissions and what capabilities you actually need. Um, writable file systems inside containers. Another risk point if you've got a, 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 a read write file system, I can download new software, I can make changes to things. Um, so, uh, you know, again, this is a sort of paradigm thing about um, how containers uh, 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 really should be configured, right? The, you know, the, the, uh, there shouldn't really be any requirement for an application to write things inside the container. You know, if we need state data, we use, um, we use uh, uh, volumes and, you know, for, for our uh, logging and things like that should all be just going to standard out and being picked up by the cluster. Um, and this is this is the capabilities piece that I was that I was mentioning. So, you know, containers have access to a pretty wide range of of Linux kernel permissions capabilities that are configured by default in the by the container runtime. And lots of these granular permissions are just never going to require by a, a typical microservice application. And they just create additional uh, uh, vectors for attackers to use if they are able to compromise that pod. Then having those kernel level permissions, um, you know, allows for 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 me as an attacker to start trying to widen the uh, the blast radius. Um, I mean, I did some work around this uh, the, this very recently, and I mean, it's pretty surprising that most things will run with no capabilities at all. Um, uh, um, that, that's certainly not the, you know, that there are applications that need to do things like modify the network, et cetera, but, you know, there are also plenty of, of, uh, of kind of stateless web applications that just won't require any capabilities configured. So um, denying, dropping all is, is a good uh, place to start. So um, where do we start with all of this in terms of, of kind of modern Git driven um, workflows? And, you know, the emerging answer is that we need to shift our security practices over to the left on this on this uh, this kind of picture of, of where things happen. And we need to embed security 
all the way through our development pipelines. And we share that burden of security responsibilities across our development and engineering teams. And this is really where this concept of DevSecOps comes into play, that we need to integrate security considerations into how we work in exactly the same way that we kind of merge development and operations together over the last few years in the DevOps movement. Um, and the, the obvious first place that we want to be looking is at the developer. We need developers to have insights um, immediately into potential security issues. And we need those tightly uh, integrated into their workflows. So that means uh, tooling that's available from local command lines, um, tooling that integrates with, with IDEs. Um, and we need to reduce the overhead for developers to use these kind of tools right at the point they're working before code even gets into our repositories. And the, the tooling that we use has to provide developers with the right information to make security decisions. Um, you know, historically, a lot of security tooling was about here's, here's just a bit massive list of CVEs and, you know, things that are that are that need to be fixed. But, you know, we really need uh, to have insights into how severe things are, how exploitable they are, along with um, remediation advice, perhaps even automated remediation. And um, as we've, we've seen, when we looked at the kinds of things that we need to be looking at, we want that to be the looking at those third party uh, dependencies in our code, our software composition analysis, what's going in into our container images and for our infrastructure code. Um, you can do all of this with, with, with Sneak for free, but other security tools um, are, are available. Um, our our second touch point is is clearly um, Git itself. You know, our Git repositories are now a single source of truth for everything. So that really has to be secure. Um, Git itself has been pretty secure over the years, um, but in most cases, people are using um, hosted Git services like GitHub, like GitLab for this, and they've been pretty good at, at security. Um, but there are definitely process related things to consider. Um, by its nature, Git can open you up to certain things and, and our users need to be aware of those. So we need to be thinking about um, enforcing two-factor authentication, you know, making sure that our users have strong key management practices and that they're keeping Git um, updated locally. Um, exposing private data is always a risk in, in, in Git repositories, particularly in commit histories and where we might be working with a, with a whole repository, perhaps we're moving things around or, or uh, importing a, 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 a complete repository. Um, the best practices here is clearly that configuration data really should never be in Git and encrypted, even in local repositories, because of that reason that it's very easy to then uh, forget that it's in there or oh, I've reverted that out but it's still in the in the in the history and then all of a sudden it's in my public repository and this is how a lot of, of things like credential leakage happens in in uh, and github so we need to educate our users about using things like dot dot git ignore to to keep certain files out um, and it, it kind of goes without saying that we need strong review processes. A lot of this is really about the human aspect and that we need to make sure that those, those processes are correct and that they're being followed. And, you know, in, in line with that idea about um, making this as frictionless as possible for our developers, um, we want to be able to automate as much of this kind of stuff as we as we as we can. We're using Git pre-commit hooks and, and automation around our around our source code management. And once we're confident that, that Git is secure, we can also leverage automation here for um, security scanning. And on every pull request, we really want to be looking for those same issues that we gave the developers access to at the local development stage. Um, but this time it's gonna be automated. Um, so, you know, scanning all that stuff every time something changes in the repository as it's coming in. Um, and, um, you know, the, these checks are automated. So we're also kind of, we, we can monitor here for things that might have changed upstream since that particular piece of code was, um, was committed. Uh, so, you know, even if our code hasn't changed, we might pick up things that have happened upstream. 
Um, and we um, we can also do ongoing scanning over time in these repositories, you know, to pick up things right in the code repository. It's very low cost to fix at this stage. So, you know, we want to, to be looking at, at our repos on an ongoing basis. And our container registries also fall into this category. Um, nothing's fixed in stone, so an image that looked fine when it was built um, may now be vulnerable. Um, if your registry has built-in scanning, take advantage of it, um, or use tools that integrate into your registry. I think con container registry scanning is, is getting to the point now where it's fairly standardized. You know, most people realize why you want to be doing container image scanning at this point, and um, there are lots and lots of ways to, to um, to make this easy um you know uh, in docker hub um sneak is actually built in so you kind of you get this anyway um and um you know it's important that we that we need that we see these things over time so uh the base image that was used might have new vulnerabilities and a lot of people aren't rebuilding their images in repositories unless they actually get changed so we may be gaining getting less and less secure over time but we're not rebuilding not repushing and so uh, we need to have that uh, that ongoing scanning of those images and another key integration point is our continuous integration systems. You know, these are designed for automation. So it's a great point to be looking at automating uh, security scanning for all those things for containers, for configuration and, and for code. Um, and, you know, we can also catch here things that have changed along the way from when that code got into the uh, source code management system. And, um, because we're rebuilding everything here, we can catch things that have changed, you know, that were outside of the scope of a single PR within the source code management system. And then the final place we want to be looking is, is production. Um, as I pointed out right at the start, um, a lot of people don't think about scanning things on an ongoing basis, but, you know, uh, containers that haven't changed very often can uh, end up with very vulnerable images. So um, we want to be looking at running containers, um, you know, doing those scans on an ongoing basis you know, on container images that are existing in our cluster. And, and also as a double check on, on new containers being spawned. Um, in this space, we can also take advantage of admission controllers, things like open policy agent, uh, so that we can actually enforce our security policies um, at the gate of the cluster. So uh, we could say, you know, has this, has this container image been scanned? Has this, does this code have vulnerabilities in it? Is it coming from a, uh, from a, uh, um, a secure repository? All those kind of things we can actually enforce and stop things from hitting the cluster um, uh, before, um, before it, it becomes uh, uh, alive. Um, the one thing I, I I'm not really touching on in, uh, in, this, um, in this presentation that you can also start to think about, and that's a real emerging area of, of, uh, of, of um, uh, container security is, is actual runtime detection of things. So anomaly detections, things like Falco and, uh, and various other projects that are out there that are about, um, that are about runtime detection. So the takeaways from all of this um, is that we need to shift security left and we need to empower developers to make decisions about security based on uh, modern tooling and modern process. Um, in, in, in the new world, um, security teams can't be gatekeepers with control over deployment. We need to consider the role of security professionals to be um, advisors and toolsmiths. Um, who allow our development teams to deliver uh, feature velocity and, and business value whilst also um, helping them to, uh, to keep things secure. And um, visibility and remediation of security issues uh, needs to be baked into every stage of our development pipelines, uh, leveraging um, automated tools to uh, scan our third party code, container images and our infrastructure code. So thank you for listening. Um, you can sign up for a, a free sneak account at the uh, the the uh, URL that's on screen. I'm happy to uh, to take any questions. Well, thank you so much, Matt, for uh, for this really uh, great presentation. A lot of insights. Uh, I, I've 
I took a couple of uh, screenshots and already tweeted them. I think there are a lot of uh, good uh, insights, especially the, the Kubernetes uh, parts that are interesting for me. Uh, there is one question uh, directly from the community. Uh, if you can share the slide deck, if that's possible. Yeah, I'm happy to share the slide deck, yeah. Cool, um, perfect. I, yeah, I'll, uh, I, I'm not sure where the best place is to do that, but um, I'm sure we can work it out offline or... Yeah, you, you can let us know and we post it to the um, to the meet, meet up. Perfect, uh, okay. And then uh, the yep. community, everyone has access to it. Um, I would have a question um, regarding uh, whenever you re regarding uh, the security of the container image. So I always thought of it of a, of a bad practice when you use the latest image. But yeah. now that I heard your talk, I was thinking about maybe using the latest image would give you the possibility or give you the advantage that you actually get all the latest security fixes into your container image whenever you, you build a new one. So would you recommend using the latest or would you go? No, uh, absolutely. I mean, you know, this is this is the, this is this thing about mutable versus immutable um, tags, right? That, um, and, and there's been quite a lot of, uh, of, of sort of discussion about this recently about uh, um, mutable tags. So latest is a mutable tag, which means that um, if it's rebuilt, the the next the next uh, build is still tag latest right so but you have no idea what's changed between the latest that was five minutes ago or the latest that's now and so um in that sense um you know you the, it's very bad practice to use mutable tags because we don't know what software we're getting and, and that kind of overrides the idea. I, I see where you're going that, oh, because it's newer, I'm getting that newer base image, therefore I'm gonna have less vulnerabilities. But, but I think um, you're, you're always better to, to, uh, to um, use immutable tags if possible, because you know, we, we really need to understand everything that's in, that's in our containers, right? I mean, I guess this is, it's an interesting, it's an interesting, um, area at the minute i mean we've myself and my colleague eric smalling have just been doing quite a lot of writing about this at the, at the minute about you know the the complexity of trying to understand you know the these what's potentially in my container image is is getting more and more um complicated and it, and you know it's more and more important for us to understand it properly but you know you start looking at, at docker files you know maybe you go and look at uh, at a particular um, a prepackaged uh, uh, image from from uh, Docker Hub. You look at the Docker file. Oh, that's got a base image in it, and then you look at that base image, and that's got another base image in it. You know, and it's kind of like, well, where's it? You know, and I think it's important for folks to understand what the you know what how does this stuff get into an image? Because it's not just a case of like, oh, I just used the upstream Python one. Do you know what I mean? It's it's like it's kind of there's a more complicated chain there, and a lot of people don't really understand how even the even the first parent images might get made, right? You know how are how are Google building distro of us? How is Debian? How does Debian build its container images? And I, I think from a security perspective, it's kind of important for us to understand that because we're starting to think more and more about these this um, this software supply chain security, you know. But how do we know from you know, the right to the start, the right to the end, that the thing is still the same thing. And, uh, you know, that's because, you know, we didn't install it from a CD-ROM like we used to. You know? <laughs> it's, it's uh, so I, I, I think these are becoming much more of an issue for people. Yeah, yeah, thanks, thanks. Um, we got a couple of questions in the chat. Um, I try to find the first one. Yeah. Um, oh. No, it's, it's here. Um, what would you say from organizational uh, organization perspective to handle the security resources in clusters? Uh, I'm not sure the or, uh, for an organization to handle the security resources in clusters. Um, I'm not quite sure what you mean there, Yusuf. Can you give us a, a, a bit more um, a bit more context on on what you mean by security resources. Maybe you can mute yourself if you want. 
or while you are typing, maybe we can go to the second question that he sent. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, validating base images, um, you know, you can look at, uh, at signing them, you know, that's a pretty common practice. Um, and, and uh, you know, restricting um, which, which registries you're, you can uh, deploy from. But, um, you know, there are various mechanisms for, for, uh, for chain of trust around, around container images. Um, and then a question from Michael. Um, what comes after detecting a vulnerable image in uh, uh, trigger CI or revert? Uh, yes, <laughs> all of the above. I, I mean, I guess it depends on what you, what you want to do, right? I mean, you know that um, it's certainly possible at any of those stages to to revert or or. or um, or just stop the the deployment. I, I guess it, I'm going to say that it's a, it's a bad answer. I know, but it depends. But isn't it like if you are you already have it up and running in your production environment, and then uh, some security screening detects that there is a vulnerability? Probably there is no way to roll back or something because it was there anyway. It was just discovered now. Is it? Um, well, I mean, you, you can imagine a whole, uh, you know, uh, uh, lots of different options there in terms of automation, though, right? Because, I mean, you know, from perhaps if you, you, you may be able to just, to, you may even be able to rebuild that image if you, you know, if we, if we have security tooling that tells us what the best, um, what the best uh, uh, option is. I mean, one of the things Snake will do, right, is suggest to you alternative base images. And, and so, um, you know, and, and uh, so I could go from, I've got four options of like base images that are gonna give me less vulnerabilities. So perhaps you might decide that uh, I'm just gonna re rebuild with a, you know, I'm gonna automate a PR there. That's another thing that, that, that Sneak can do is automate fixed PRs. So um, you might decide that that's something you want to do, or, or you may just want to, uh, want to um, uh, notify somebody. I mean, it's it's one of those things that it, it just depends, doesn't it? Got it. And then uh, Yusuf was coming back with a clarification to his question. Um, the, it, it was around the uh, organizational perspective. Like yeah, I mean, these, are, these are interesting ones. I mean, it, we've just done a, um, uh, 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 some work around a cloud native um, um, security report that we're going to be launching slightly later in the year and this is one of the areas that that we were that we were talking to folks about is you know who is responsible for this stuff in terms of cloud native infrastructure these days and um i think what's what's interesting is that there's um even on the on the uh the sort of policy level within clusters that responsibility is uh, sitting more with the development team as well i don't necessarily think that's a uh, a, a, a wrong thing, right? Because, you know, I, I, I'm just, the, the, we just need to make sure that we've got the right information there because who understands the application better, right? I mean, when we look at network policies within a cluster, within an application, perhaps where we're talking about pathways between different services, who's best placed to decide on what's appropriate there? You know, I mean, it's probably the folks who wrote the code to start with, right? Um, but I think we need to make sure that, that folks have an understanding of what the implications of some of these some of these things are. Um, so I, I think um, security the security teams in, in by security teams we mean infosec right they, they get more and more of this where this is working really successfully this DevSecOps practice is where um, there is uh, big pushes towards um, a kind of education and making sure that teams understand. Uh, when I go to deploy a new service, here are the things I should be thinking about. You know, not like, here's what we tell you, you must do, you must not open X to what, what you know, it's, it's kind of like, um, you know, uh, just passing that, that, um, that knowledge further down the development workflow so that people can understand what the implications are of their actions. I I have a question. It's not totally related to what we are discussing, but 
during your uh, during your slides, I saw some some uh, some issues that you shared, and there was like um, critical. So the the it, it was high, medium, and low. And how I would like just out of interest to know how do you classify the those vulner vulnerabilities? Uh, let, me, let me just get one on the screen. Uh, so where were we? Oh, so we're, we're looking at this kind of stuff, right? Uh, uh, well, I'm not seeing uh, your screen, but oh, you know, uh, uh, I, uh, I guess this. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly that, that stuff, right? Okay. Um, so. Um, this is one of the other interesting things that that uh, we believe is really important for um, uh, for developers. You know, when we talk about developer first security, this idea about prioritization becomes super important because how do I know what I should be fixing, and how do I know where to start? Um, you know, typically um, vulnerabilities are assigned a score anyway, right? The CVSS score, which is based on a number of uh, things about that that particular um, vulnerability. This is a standard set of scoring. Um, but what Sneak adds in um, things to that scoring that we think are um, uh, maybe more appropriate for, the, for a particular developer to work out what the things are that they should be doing first. So, for example, in the, the Sneak uh, priority is based on a combination of um, the CVS score of the, uh, of the actual vulnerability, but also um, uh, is there an exploit uh, for that vulnerability in the wild? Um, and most importantly, in a way to do with the developer prioritization is, is there a fix for it, right? Because like, if there's a fix and it's exploitable in the wild and it's a pretty high CVSS score anyway, then why wouldn't you just fix it, right? Like the number, that's it, because that's easy. <laughs> You know, all they do is open a PR and change the version number, and it's it's done. So uh, there's a there's a um, sort of working out the the prioritization and um, remediation stuff is really what what Sneak focus on with uh, uh, you know in terms of this developer first kind of approach, just making it m much easier for folks to understand what the uh, what things they ought to um, fix first and what things they can maybe uh, w worry about less. I mean, I still think we've got a lot of, um, of work to do uh, in, in general as an industry to look at, the, at this space, right? Because I, I still think there's a lot of confusion about people, you know, we see it in container image um, scanning where people are like, why, why can't I have a container image with like no vulnerabilities in it? But are you ever going to get container rooms with zero vulnerabilities in it? Or perhaps if it's based on Scratch and you don't have any applications in it, you know, maybe. But, you know, at zero, I don't think zero vulnerabilities is, is really a, a should necessarily be your goal, right? Because a lot of them won't be exploitable in, in they may not be exploitable in a container. They may only be exploitable if you've got root access. You know, there's so many variables in. And so, um, I've been been starting to to do some writing around this whole space about like well my container's got 500 vulnerabilities what do I do now and you know your goal isn't necessarily to get to zero vulnerabilities you know the, everything's trade offs all the time isn't it you know perhaps I assume that my uh, I'm protecting elsewhere about um, you know uh, achieving root inside if if if, if I need root to exploit a particular thing. I decide, well, that's, you know, that's low risk in my environment because I have these other protections in place that are going to stop anybody from getting root in that container. Does that awesome. make sense? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thank you. Uh, we oh. got another question from Josef. Uh, what do you think about hardening pipeline of base images? Is it a good thing or complicated without a real added value do you mean do you mean hardening like taking a base image off the shelf and then deciding that you're going to start changing the 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 configuration of the base image yes well i mean again <laughs> these things are trade-offs aren't they i mean once you start doing that then you perhaps you've got to ask yourself whether you need a base image at all 
you know, because if you're going to start actually rewriting the the Docker file for Debian or or whoever base image you're using, are you just better off going to using Scratch and building the whole thing yourself, right? And I mean, that that's a that's a decision that 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 everybody's going to take individually. I mean, if your if your application has no dependencies and you know it's it's um like it's written in go it's got no dependencies and it's a simple microservice why would you be running a base image because what do you need in that base image you know so i i think it's uh it's something that you that you have to bear in mind when you start modifying base images is like is that the right base image or should i even be using a base image because i don't think you want to get into because from that point onwards, if you've modified that Docker file, let's say you've taken the Debian base image, you've modified the Docker file. I've seen some of these blog posts where people say all these things about hardening containers, but it's like, well, as soon as you've started modifying the Docker file, you own that Docker file. You've got to maintain that Docker file forever. And so, you know, I'd say there's probably marginal value to that. You know, most most upstream, most upstream, uh, base image maintainers, and by that I'm talking about uh, distributions, you know, out the folks who do Alpine, Debian, you know, I'm not talking about uh, some random PHP container that happens to be hosted on, uh, on, um, on Docker Hub. I'm not picking on PHP, it could be anything, right? I mean, more like <laughs> a random image that somebody built and put on Docker Hub. Um, but but most most upstream uh, most major upstreams probably understand more about container hardening than than we do from that perspective because they're doing it every day. So yeah, I mean I think it's it's probably marginal, and I think if you get to that stage, you have to be thinking: Am I using the right base image, or should I just not use a base image and build it myself? And if you can build it yourself, and it's a really simple, you know, something based on scratch is going to be there's there's no there's very limited attack vectors on it right so it's always going to be preferable to um to something that's got all libraries code and and you know shells and all the rest in it so cool uh thanks so much uh, also thanks for for all the questions um i think uh we stop here for the questions um we had a, a, quite a couple of them. Um, thanks for, for sharing all the insights and, and also the great presentation. Um,